coming up on Theatre Talk. Smash failed because I wasn't in it enough. <laughs> Smash failed because you were in it. <laughs> that you was think, the problem. You if it had lasted a third season, I was going to become a huge oh, character well, in the whole thing. And then they canceled it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Talking. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. I'm known as Squire Edward Dickinson's half crap daughter. <laughs> well, I am. The neighbors can't figure me out. I don't cross my father's ground to any house or town. I haven't left the house in years. When the censor taker asked my occupation, I just said, at home. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, you know, Susan, when I was a kid, uh, the great Julie Harris uh, toured through my uh, town, Rochester, New York, with The Bell of Amherst, the great play about Emily Dickinson. And I remembered, I think I must have been 10 or 11 when I saw it. It was one of the very first things I saw in the theater. I fell in love with Julie Harris, and I fell in love with Emily Dickinson, and I fell in love with the theater. Well, if you fell in love with Julie Harris in this role, you are ecstatic over our guest tonight in this role. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm always, always in love with uh, one of the uh, uh, great acting families, uh, the Redgraves, and we have, um, we have one of the daughters here with us tonight, Jolie Richardson, welcome to Theater Talk, <laughs> who is giving Julie Harris, I must say, a run for her money, and that's a very good run, as Emily Dickinson in a revival of The Bell of Amherst at the West Side Theater, directed by Steve Cosson. So welcome to Theater Talk, both of you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. So it was, you were 10. I was 10. Well, Julie, Julie was, an, she was a, an old-fashioned actress in the sense that she believed in touring. Stars That's on. what just impressed me, yeah. just hearing you say that and, and thinking, gosh, she toured with this, she did it for three years. Can you imagine being so enraptured with this role, which you do beautifully, that you would hang on and keep doing it and touring it? Um, I think it is one of those roles that comes along very, very rarely. And it's sort of stupendous and it's sort of different. And, um, uh, you know, my friends that have come, they've said, God, it's special. And, and people can't quite put their fingers, so I can completely see how, how young boys <laughs> would go and see um, a magical lady, obviously I'm not talking about myself, but up there on the stage, dressed all in white, saying these incredible things about life, about the spheres, about, you know, earth is short, which is a funny sentence she has, earth is short, not life is short. She mm. actually has life is short as well. But really talking about life in this sort of very magical way, it's very profound. People keep saying to me, are you having fun? Are you having fun? And it, fun's not the exact <laughs> word because it's tough. It's a tough you role. You are out you, there you by yourself. every muscle. Wax. The second act is yeah. incredibly emotional. Mm. And, and someone at the stage door said to me last night, gosh, are you okay? You know, are, do you have a cold, your sinuses? And I was like, no, that's all the crying. <laughs> <laughs> I have this unfortunate thing that when I cry, my nose runs. And um, so probably, you know, everyone's thinking, poor love, she has a terrible cold, week in, week out. That's but exactly <laughs> what I asked Julie Harris when I was at the stage no door way. at 10 years old. No said, way. Do you have a cold, no. Miss Harris? Oh, you would have made me cold. <laughs> I wish you said yes, and I'd have feel less inadequate. Well, I'm teasing, I'm but do you know what? I never met Julie, but I, you know, I, from interviews that I've seen, she just seems like such a beautiful lady, and I'm inspired by her. Let's bring Steve into the conversation here. Um, we weren't meaning to neglect you, Steve. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, she's stepping in to fill uh, um, uh, the, the shoes of the great Julie Harris, but Charles Nelson Riley, who was on the show back in the day, he was the original director of The Bell of Amherst. Indeed he was. Have Indeed you, he was. Have you plucked anything from um, his original production? Have you seen any notes or studied <laughs> any stage directions he may have come up with? Oh, I mean, all we have is the stage directions in, in the script, some of which we used, some of which we did not use. Uh, They've reinvented this from the I from think the it's other. very, what we're doing is very, very different, very is it different edgier? from the. Is it more edgy? You're more athletic, oh. and oh, we were talking about your chakras are open. More, <laughs> more, <laughs> you're taller. More, <laughs> more exuberant. I actually um, can't wait when, when this is all over. I do really want to see Julie Harris's one. I read an interview with you in the Wall Street Journal that you started to watch because it was made for the uh, tape for PBS, I remember. Yeah. And you started to watch it, and then you said, I can't, 
I can't watch any more of this. Yeah, it was a couple of months ago when I, I just needed to hear the New England sound and I couldn't, um, I, I was away, I, I, was, I was on holiday and I had to start getting the idea of the New England sound and it's very difficult because, you know, in 18, 80 say how did how did people speak it's not as it is now and so i thought oh well i'll just see and then i was surprised to see i watched five minutes and i was like i can't watch anymore it's did you that. watch it steve and your preparations to direct i did i watched it once mm -hmm. so i watched it i watched it the day that i got the call from my agent saying would you want to put yourself up for the bell of amherst which i i knew but i'd never read it never seen it and i had about a couple hours before the phone call the next morning <laughs> and I found it on YouTube. This is a very different kind of project. You did the Mr. Uh, Mr. Burns, a post-electric play. Wonderful, yeah, wonderful, but year. very different. So, uh, Jolie, why did they hire Steve? <laughs> ask Steve. Uh, yeah, I'll see you. Why did you ask Steve? I got hired first. <laughs> oh, you got hired first? Yes. yes. Oh. It's generally the director, and then they decide on the casting. So yeah. I know you don't know much about the theater, but that's how it works. Well, sometimes, well, she's right. it's sometimes, sometimes it goes the way. other way. I have to yeah. defend myself, Michael Riedel. There's plenty of times they come up with the star first. I had heard that you weren't completely on board. I certainly didn't hire Steve. It was all Don Gregory, our producer. Yeah. Um, it was who did it originally, I believe, Don. Who did it originally. Yeah. No, I was on board for a few months. I just didn't have an executed contract because that takes a while sometimes. So I'm going to ask a more uber question. Why Emily Dickinson? Why are we so fascinated by this woman, this reclusive woman who spent the majority of her life in her, in her house with her spinster sister and a lot of it taking care of her mother? Why is she one of the most important American poets or one of the most important poets in the English language? Why? That is an uber yeah. question. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll start with a somewhat obnoxious answer, which is I think that she is important for us to watch because she is one of the greatest American poets. Mm. I mean, why she's one of the greatest American poets is probably a, a, a longer answer, but. And a more metaphysical. <laughs> well, more the, metaphysical, but I do, the, I, I think her, the, the power, her words are like swords. They really just slice right through you. So contemporary, so and modern. Back to yeah, you. and they and they are, as a great singular artist, I think part of why she works for a play and why this play worked in the 1970s, why it works now, is because she was a singular creation. She created herself. Mm -hmm. uh, she was certainly drawing on all sorts of knowledge and things that she read and other writers and it's not like she was an outsider artist but her force of originality and her force of vision were sui generis mm. am i pronouncing that right <laughs> um i'm not entirely sure uh and she, she also it, she had a whole new style which is why right. you know her great maestro or preceptor Professor Higginson didn't get her, but he also didn't get Walt Whitman. Mm -hmm. You know, he said all these dashes, it's very uncontrolled. Uh, modern, bad it was modern. Rhymes. Yes, it was, yeah, and she, you know, yeah. she defended herself saying, my meter is new, experimental, right. not spasmodic. Even though she was, I think, agoraphobic, or whatever, whatever, whatever you want to diagnose it, like she did not go outside. And they don't really know why, do they? That she did well, they, yes. don't, they don't really no. know why. Um, I mean, it seems she out. had a, a breakdown, they think, between the ages of 30 and 32, but other people yeah. say this didn't happen, and in our play, she says it's not important or I'm going to slant the truth. I think she did become agoraphobic, but then she did work in her garden and mm. she did visit her brother's house. So. They didn't have, I think, the labels yes, exactly. then. That and a lot they didn't of rush, rush off to get pros. And she wasn't famous. People were not. And she wasn't famous. Yeah. People right. weren't exactly. writing about her or studying her. Well, I, mean, I, was, I, I think I think the, the um, plays always work so well because her poetry is is autobiographical. I mean, really, what we know of her, we know through her thoughts, in in the poems. And there's a lot which is deeply personal, and the play works, I think, so well. And so it, because the playwright William Luce is able yeah. to you know, go right from a letter to a scene with somebody into the poem that mm -hmm. seems to spring directly out of that relationship, you know, in a pretty compelling and convincing way. But, but she also created characters in her, 
poems. In some of her poems, she's a boy. Yeah. And also, she is naughty. And that was actually one of the first things that I responded to reading yeah. the play, is that it wasn't like worthy and it wasn't, yeah, yeah. you know, she's naughty and she's mischievous and she's Human. playing with yeah. the audience, like right off the bat, giving them this sort of ludicrous recipe yeah. for a cake <laughs> and she's sort of saying this is my take on life it's not linear every american was introduced to emily dickinson at some point in school and whether our teacher was 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 good or mediocre or whatever we got some impression of her and certainly for my generation you know i think the impression that i got in middle school or whenever we first read her was she was, a rec she was a recluse, she never married, she never left her house. She made these, these very intricate, intricate, you know, small poems. And, and then you extrapolate a personality from that. You fill in the gaps and you think, oh, she's a quiet, shy, Victorian woman. And, and so when I first actually, you know, uh, read the play and, and and did watch the Julie Harris version on, on YouTube and you're hit with this personality. I mean, it's delightful and it's engaging and, and it really messes with your idea of who Emily Dickinson was. And then you realize, oh, well, the, this idea of Emily Dickinson in my head is No more valid than wrong. William Luce's version yes, of her, because exactly. we really don't know. We, we watched a lot of documentaries, didn't we? We, yes. we did quite a lot of research, and in some of them, you know, she could also be aggressive and disturbing. She was a whole package. Yeah, yeah. so much of the play comes from her words. Most of it is, is her language, from her letters, mm -hmm. from something that w is known that she said to someone, and... <laughs> And she's, and she is, she's funny, and she's caustic, and she's Itchy sneaky, sometimes. and she likes a gossip sometimes. She likes a gossip. <laughs> she had affairs. Well, um, we we well, disagree on this. The fine well, affairs, but it's she, interesting that everyone can have different opinions on. Right. I mean, you think, had, she had, you think she had affairs well, with? If, if you have, if you write twenty years of love letters back and forth with someone, I would call that an affair, whether you Consumated. ever. Oh, and consumate. you think you think she was a virgin? I do actually, yes. I, I'm going to go on work on saying no, I. No, I would say she's virgin. probably a. Yeah. She I might have say kissed a, a girlfriend or something, but I would say she maybe she even kissed one of the gentlemen, but I doubt it. I have a feeling she was a virgin. Yeah. I agree. I have that oh, feeling cool. too. All right. We can't fight with the women. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, revival of the Belle of Amherst by uh, William Luce at the West Side Theater, starring. Julie Richardson, thank you for being our guest tonight at Theatre Talk, and directed pleasure. by Steve Cosson. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? <laughs> then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They banish us, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell one's name the live long June to an admiring bog. So, Michael, I have invited my two new best friends oh, to our show today, and I'll let you introduce them. <laughs> These are two great, great friends of mine and two terrific reporters here covering the Broadway scene. And we're going to bring you up to speed on all the stuff that's been happening as we're midway through the fall season on Broadway. Uh, I want to introduce my good friend Stephanie Cohen of The Wall Street Journal. Welcome to Theatre Talk, and I believe this is your debut on television. It is. Thank Don't you for having me. Don't be nervous. And my, <laughs> my old sparring partner from the Don Imus show in Hollywood and Vine. And Imogen Lloyd Webber, who's a reporter for Broadway.com. Welcome, ladies. Thank you for having us. To the theater talk. All right, Imogen, uh, yeah. about a year ago, I guess, you and I hosted a viewing party for we The did. Sound of Music on yeah. NBC. Turned out to be one of the highest rated things M M NBC has done in a long, 22 long time. 22 million viewers. 22 million yeah. viewers, that's right. And they're coming back in December with... Peter Pan, even though you and I lobbied for some other shows, <laughs> but did. they picked Peter Pan. I'm not entirely sure about Peter Pan. I mean, the wonderful thing about Sound of Music is that everybody can sing along. Everybody knows every single song. Right. And Peter Pan, although it obviously has this amazing history of telecast and so forth, I'm not sure that the score is as well known. I could sing you every song. You're I mean, the first person. Don't no, please. Sing one. <laughs> you no, think, you think it's bad when I sing Imogen? Listen Mary to her. 
Mary Martin's Peter Pan was on when I was a child, and I'm telling you, it's a very catchy score. You I'm and fine. your demographic will know it. It is riskier, I think. It's, it's risky. riskier undertaking than, say, Sound of Music. Um, and indeed, Fox have been talking about doing Grease, haven't they? And that makes perfect sense to me because everybody knows every single song. Song from Grease. And that's the whole point, is that we sat there at our party and we, we had a little bit of wine. <laughs> uh, it's very strange. <laughs> We sat there and we sang a lot. Uh, I mean, I every oh, shut I up. did not. I did not. The thing that excites me about this upcoming broadcast of Peter Pan is Captain Hook, Christopher Walken, who yeah. I think could give a terrific villainous performance, don't you? I think that people will tune in just to see him yeah. do it in his strange accent, Captain Hook with his inflection. Yeah, it's going to be quite camp, I think. We have a picture of Alison Williams here. She's wearing this Peter Pan outfit that seems to be made out of <laughs> Lizards. I mean, we know it's made out of plastic, but it looks like Peter Pan's been out skinning lizards all day. Zayden and Marin, why, why do you have him out there being, you know, a killer? Why can't he wear leaves like Mary Martin? I mean, it's always interesting with, with this particular producing pair because they've, they've got all these Broadway vets in to yeah. make, to steady the ship, as it were. Craig Zayden, so Neil Marin, yeah. yeah. Yep. So the, uh, the Lost Boys are all newsies. Um, you've got Christian Ball, who's in everything. He was That's in The Sound right. of Music Live. He was my co-star in Smash. Smash. Yes. Uh, and, of course, Kelly O'Hara, who will be seen uh, this season, actually, in The King and I. She'll be doing right. that in Lincoln Center in the spring. Craig uh, and Neil, Craig um, um, Zayden and Neil Marin, have just hooked up with the Schubert organization, and they're going to be they're going to be producing shows with the Schuberts. Yeah. And the Schuberts have not produced shows in a long, in a, long in time. In a while. I mean, they've, they've signed this three-year deal. Um, now, of course, Neil and Craig ha have been dipping their toes into Broadway, not just with Smash. Right. Uh, they put some money into How to Succeed. Uh, with Promises, Radcliffe. promises. They yes. did with Kristen Chenoweth. Um, so th they do love Broadway. I am fully expecting an announcement at the end of December that Peter Pan will be coming into a Schubert house. The Schubert's, of course, own 17 Broadway theatres. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm almost, I mean, I, you can just see that happening now, can't you, that there'll be a revival of Peter Pan after this telecast in December. With the numbers that Sound of Music did, if mm. Peter Pan does that, you gin up interest in the show, yeah. and then you go direct to Broadway, and you can make, make a fortune. Zayden and Marin were doing downtown theatre, and then... I first became aware of them when they produced the TV movie directed by Rob Marshall of Annie, yeah. which really established his movie career. Mm -hmm. And then they were doing this, Zayden and Marin were bringing in, music, do, redoing plays. Yeah. I think they did The Music Man with Matthew Broderick and those things. So now they're touring it all the way around, going back to Broadway. I just find it funny that like, shows about Broadway, which I would think would be inherently so dramatic and fun, like Smash, which mm -hmm. they also did, Yes. they fail, but then they have the telecasts. And they do the so Oscars. They and there's an audience for it, but yeah. why, well, how come the, sh the dramatic shows about, or the sitcoms about Broadway never I worked? mean, Smash failed because I wasn't in it enough. <laughs> Smash <laughs> failed because you were in it, <laughs> That you was think, the problem. You if it had lasted the third season, I was going to become a huge oh, character well, in the whole production. And then they canceled it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Shocking. Uh, Steffi, you wanted to bring up um, On the Town. Now, I, I haven't seen it yet, and I must say, as much as I love the old Broadway musicals, I am not sure there's an audience for them anymore. I mean, they sound like your grandmother's show. On the Town, great show in its day, Comden and Green and Bernstein. It? No, I've not seen it, but Plenty I've seen old productions of it. But I'm just, my, my oh, point okay. is, though, that I just don't, I don't think there's any interest in these old shows, but you, a younger person, much younger than Susan, you really, <laughs> you really like On the Town, right? <laughs> well, I went in expecting what you're saying, that yeah. it would be, you know, creaky or kind of dusty or whatever, and it's so, it's so raunchy. And really beautiful as well, because it has Jerome Robbins-inspired choreography. It's about these three guys trying to get laid yeah. in New York for one day. The sailors, you know, come to town and they are all looking to get laid. But it, the sexuality. Yes. The sexual energy. And the songs are man. hilarious. Yeah. And it has roles for great character actors. Jackie Hoffman is hilarious. But if done well and if done properly, it should in the end also have poignancy, because it's entirely possible that these three sailors who are going back to war, right. all three may be killed. This may be the it it ends on a very sad lives. note. Yeah, where is the time all gone to? Haven't oh, done sh half the things we Please, Right, it does. And they're going back to, to war, war and they'll never see the women again, maybe. And it is the quintessential American musical. I mean, you stand there, you have to stand for the national anthem, there's a flag. Right, right. I, of course, don't know the words. Everybody's looking at me going, who are you? You're a dreadful human being. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to try and sing this. There's no way. I can say, God save the queen. Anyway. But it is, it's a quintessential American musical, um, and it is very good for families. So you're saying, who's the audience? That's the audience. Whereas, say, Sing coming in with The Last Ship, which yeah. is a new musical, that's a much bigger risk, let's say, for a producer than On the Town. Yeah, and also the Sting musical has not been selling that well, and I do know that Sting was a little bit concerned about the box office, and I think... 
How do you know that? Uh, because I'm called a reporter. <laughs> and I think uh, what Sting has discovered is that um, people want to see Sting in concert. Right. They just they don't necessarily care that Sting wrote the, the score. The show I'm recommending to people the most is The Curious. Oh, House. me yeah. too. It's my favorite. I, I just That's for kids it. and grandparents. I mean, that works on I 20 wonder levels, what, too. It's uh, called what? The Curious Incident of the Dog of, in, in the, the Night. Time. Thank you, Mike. I wonder at what age it starts being appropriate, but it's Probably wonderful. like seven. Really? I, Eight. I feel like that's the bit older. I would say 11. Yeah. But uh, 11. Whatever, it's wonderful. This extraordinary piece of theatre, it is mind-blowingly good. I mean, it's to me, it's what theatre is supposed to be all about. Uh, from the sets, to the acting, to the script, it's just seamless. And what is great, I think, is, is that there are no big stars attached to it. Yeah. And so often now with plays, especially on Broadway, you have yeah. Hugh Jackman come in three months. And it's great for Broadway that Hugh Jackman does want to come. It's great that Bradley Cooper's here. It's great that the Gyllenhaal siblings are, are in this season. But at the same time, to have a show that's just here because of the work, I yep. mean, that's extraordinary. But that speaks to how, how the national, being subsidized, mm -hmm. theater that's subsidized, it, it's not expected to do well. It's just they want to actually make an artistic well, it's so this is expensive. Expensive. and this came from right, but yeah. it wasn't when they started yeah. it because I spoke to Simon Stevens mm -hmm. and to the director Marion Elliott, and she said, you know, they wanted to see if we could adapt this best-selling book, and they gave us a tiny theater. Yeah. I think it were like 40 performances it was scheduled for. Really? So they were allowed to do whatever they wanted. It, it was given a budget, and it was not supposed to make a profit, which is why, like Matilda. Well, no, Matilda was, was the yeah. Royal Shakespeare Royal Company, Shakespeare. right? And, and that was and also that was a risk. Because it's so risk creative, too. they don't they don't have to think of the lowest common denominator or what's going to be commercial or bringing in or, a big yeah, star. Bringing in Carrie Underwood because she's a record. And it's well, and that, that uh, this yeah. this country doesn't have that, and. Um, you see it. It's tough. I mean, one in five Broadway shows make money. Um, Is that right? It's, yeah, it's, it's a huge risk. And also, just the money that, that goes into Broadway shows. It's two and a half million dollars at least for a play, um, ten mm. million dollars at least for, at a, least musical. for a musical. Now. And that's three times what it is in London. So even if you're producing oh. commercially in London, it's a lot cheaper. So therefore, producers are obviously a bit more wary, especially in, in America, about what they're going to produce. But also, theatre goers are, because their tickets are three times more than they are in London. Yeah. So in London, you're going to get an audience that may take a risk to go and see Curious Instant because the tickets are less. Mm -hmm. Whereas You'll here, get younger they, people. Yeah. Whereas here, they're going to have to put out that much more money. You want to go see Matthew Broderick and Nathan Lane, yeah. and it's only a play. It's going to cost you two seventy-five for seats. But for everyone X. wants to go see it. We've got to wrap it up. What uh, uh, are you looking forward to coming up in uh, the later fall here, or the winter, or the spring? Is there a production that you've got your eye on? I'm excited to see um, the real thing. I'm going. Tom Stoppard's old. Yeah, player. yeah. I love Tom Stoppard, and I like I like the club. I think it's intellectual and doesn't and doesn't you know ca cater to. People that you know just want sort of bland entertainment or commercial it entertainment. Um, it's that's actually at Roundabout. Not exactly but a big risk for the Roundabout to no, do it. No, but they did a bring Tony in award-winning Tom Stoppard play that's 30 years but old. But they did bring in a play that's never been done in, in New York of his because he said if you want to do the real thing, do India. India, India. India. yeah, which is quite a good play. Which is a great play and right. kind of a um, precursor, or actually it was written after, but it's sort of a, a version of Arcadia. Arcadia, that deals very with those, similar. Yeah, yeah those yeah. same. And anything you want to draw our attention to, Emma? Um, coming I'm fascinated by Hugh Jackman's choice of the river, which mm -hmm. is a small play that was in London's Royal Court Theatre, yep. uh, and he's doing it in a very small venue. Let's face it here, Circle in the Square, mm -hmm. and I'm fascinated to see why he picked that. For have you read the play? Do you know I the play? I know. I know nothing about the play, and I'm looking forward to seeing why he's doing this three-hander and not a great big Broadway show because he could do anything. He could, but I think that uh, he was been, he's been casting about for a musical. He just hasn't found one yet, and he likes to come to Broadway at least every other year. So if the big musical doesn't come together, he's going to look for a, uh, what happened a play to, to do. Houdini? He dropped out. He, he, he made like Houdini, and he, um, he vanished okay. from the project. I think when Sorkin escaped, it was around the time that Sorkin went as well. Jackman. Aaron Jackman Sorkin was going yeah. to write it, yeah. But, you know, I, I, it's, it is a risk for him because... He, he became famous on Broadway doing The Boy From Oz, which was not a great musical, but he turned it into a great theatrical event. But I'm not so sure he wants to have to do that again and carry a $15 million musical that's not great on your back for, for a year. That's heavy lifting. I mean, poor Nathan Lane had to do that with, with the Adams Family, and they, they'll all tell you it's not fun to be in a show that isn't any good. So you, they want to pick something that they know is going to be as good as they, they will be as but a performer. Th this is a risk, too, because it's a short play, and it's an unknown play, and people like to see him in musicals. Yeah, but remember, it's a, limit, it's a limited run. It's only, what, 12 or 13 weeks. It's Hugh Jackman, so it's no matter what happens, it's going to sell out. You can't do yeah. a big musical as a limited run. Yeah.
Well, I just think people want to see him singing and dancing. They do. They do. But, you know, until he, finds, until he finds something to sing and dance in, they'll have to make do with showing off that he's a dramatic actor. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Uh, Stephanie Cohn from The Wall Street Journal and my friend Imogen Lloyd Webber from I Miss in the Morning, Hollywood and Vine, and Broadway.com. Thank you for being our, our pundits and our commentators and for bringing the average age of our guests down <laughs> by about 30,000 years. <laughs> How <laughs> Thank old you is very Michael? Much, ladies. I'm 48. Ish. Well, are we going to say good night? Say good night. Oh. Say good night. Put the camera on me. Oh, God. The no, camera, no, no. no. <laughs> we have these two beautiful women. Why the camera on you? <laughs> good night, Michael. Again, it's been such a pleasure. <laughs> good night, Imogen. Good night, Stephanie. <laughs> You guys are insane. <laughs> New York, New York, New York. It's a hell of a town. We've got one day here and not another minute to see the famous sights. We'll find the romance and danger waiting in it beneath the Broadway lights. But we've had our chest, so what we like the best are the nights. Side night, night, New York, New York, a hell of a town. The Bronx is up, but the battery's down. The people ride in a hole in the ground. New York, New York, it's a hell of a town. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the Theater Development Fund's Technical Accessibility Program, which helps provide closed captioning. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>